Roll for Crit presents How to Play Sons of Fariel in five minutes or less or more. Sons of Fariel is the game of gathering magical essences and fending off vile corruption in a fantastical realm. Designed by Christian Zoli and published by Tabula Games. Your goal in Sons of Fariel is to guide your tribe of Waybits to victory by accomplishing more achievements than any other player or by giving in to corruption and bringing doom upon the land. Each player begins with one player board and a set of pieces in their color. These pieces will be assigned to specific areas of your player board and the main board. You'll also have three phase tiles and four different hero tiles, each with an associated mask. Each color of hero tile represents a different type of hero, adventurer, druid, shaman, or chieftain. You'll start the game by choosing one to place on its active side to the right of your player board, while the rest are inactive to the left. The main board is split up into eight areas, separated by thick white lines, each represented by one great guardian animal. Each area is divided into four regions by these thinner white lines. And each region has a designated terrain type, mountain, meadow, river, or forest. Some regions will have terrain tokens placed on them at the start of the game, which means they have two terrain types. These regions are known as heartlands. And these rounded spots along the borders are called nodes. After the initial setup, the first player begins by placing one of their settlements into a region of their choice. Then, the other players do the same in turn order. Following this, everyone will place a second settlement into a different region, but this time in reverse turn order starting with the last player. A settlement cannot be placed into a region if there is already a settlement there. Players' remaining settlements go onto these spots on their player boards. Now, in turn order, players get to take one of their three Waybit figures and make them a hero. Give them the mask of your active hero tile, and place them onto one of the nodes of an owned region, meaning it contains one of your settlements. Finally, each player receives two essence cards of their choice that match the terrain color of their two owned regions in any combination. Menace tokens will also be added to the board randomly from the event bag. These are assigned to specific guardians and will come into play later. In a two-player game, players begin with three settlements on the board, plus a second active hero. And in a three-player game, players get an additional essence card. With all that out of the way, the game can begin. There are three distinct phases in Sons of Fariel. On a player's turn, they will choose a phase and flip their associated phase tile face down to indicate it's been activated. After completing their turn, the next player will do the same. All players can choose the same or different tiles on their turns as they see fit, but once a tile has been flipped, that phase cannot be chosen again until the following round. The round ends once all players have completed all three of their phases. First, let's cover the tribe phase, during which you can spend essences in exchange for upgrades and abilities. There are seven tribe phase actions you can choose from to perform in any order and any number of times as long as you can afford to. Spend one of each color essence to dress a new hero. Take one of your way bits and give it a mask from one of your in active tiles and place it onto a node next to a region you own just like at the start of the game. This will activate that hero tile. You'll be able to activate these heroes in a different phase. To enhance a hero's actions or perhaps provide them with new ones, you can level them up by purchasing perk tiles from this area of the board. Spend two essences, either both red or both blue, plus one additional essence of the same color for each perk that hero already has. In exchange, take one face-up perk tile from the board and put it to the right of the relevant hero tile. You can then also take a second face-up perk tile and place it at the bottom of its pile. You can build a new settlement by spending an amount of essences equal to the number of settlements you've already placed on the board, this time either all green or all yellow. Take the lowest settlement from your player board and place it into a vacant region next to one you already own, or next to one of your heroes. This area of the board houses the beacons and spiritual totem. For two yellows and a red, you can take a beacon from here and place it into a region that doesn't have a beacon already. Or you can take the spiritual totem and place it into one of your owned regions if that region also has a beacon in it. After placing the totem, one of the yellow essences you spent must be placed in its space. Any player can take control of the totem and move it on their turn, but the cost will be increased by one yellow essence for each card in this pile. The cost for beacons will remain the same. These pieces will help you remove menace tokens later on during the event phase. Finally, there are some cards you can purchase on the board. Heirloom Herbs, which cost two greens and one red, and Attunement Cards, which cost two blues, one green, and one yellow. Heirloom Herbs may provide you with discounts for future advancements, allow you to place new terrain tokens, help you with achievements, or provide more actions during the hero phase. After purchasing one face-up herb, you must also discard a second, then replace the empty spots with new cards from the deck. 
Attunement cards, one found in each area of the board, may also allow you to place tokens, get an achievement boost, or move your heroes around during the hero phase. Attunement cards are cheaper if you have settlements in that card's area. You can pay one fewer essence of your choice for each settlement that you have there. Note that each hero type also comes with an innate ability, giving them a discount of that color for specific advancements. This discount can only be used once during the tribe phase. Now let's go over the event phase. Unlike the tribe phase, this phase has a series of steps that you must follow in a specific order. First, take a look at your essence cards. On the back of each essence is one of the great guardians. If you'd like, you can reveal one of these guardians to the table in order to move its piece from one region to another within its own area, along with its menace token if it's on top of one. Next, you'll carry out what is called a menace draft. Check the position of the doom token on its track. Depending on how far along it is, you'll draw between one and three tokens from the event bag, resolving each one one at a time. Most commonly, you'll draw a menace token. Place it underneath the guardian depicted on its side. Menace tokens are double-sided, so whichever side you see first is where it goes. If the guardian in question already has a token, then discard it instead and advance the doom token one space. You might also draw a corruption token. This will trigger a corruption event, which provides you with four choices. One, yield to corruption by taking a corruption essence and advancing your corruption token one space. Corruption essences can be spent in place of any other color. Two, you can ignore corruption by simply advancing the doom token another space. Three, cleanse your tribe by paying one essence matching the color of one of your active heroes in order to move your corruption token back one space. Or four, cleanse corruption by again paying an essence matching an active hero's color and moving the doom token back one space. This option also allows you to discard a Great Guardian's Corruption Token if they have one. Whatever you choose to do, the Corruption Token you just drew will be placed underneath its depicted Guardian, replacing any other Menace Token they may have had. There's also one Havoc Token in the bag. When this is drawn, the Doom Token advances by one space, and all previously discarded tokens are added back into the bag. Doom and Corruption are important aspects of the game that we'll explain fully in a bit. Once the Menace Draft is complete, you can solve a Menace on the board if you're able to. If you control a beacon and it is next to a menace token of a matching color, you can discard that token and draw one matching essence card. Then your tracking token of that color advances one space on your player board. You can also solve a menace with the spiritual totem, but the totem allows you to choose any menace token on the board. The last step of the event phase is harvest. Now we'll look at the harvest wheel in the corner of the board. At the start of the game, a token is placed onto a random spot on this wheel. During the harvest phase, you can move it forward a certain number of spaces. This can be between one and the number in the highest empty settlement slot on your player board. The more settlements you build, the farther you can move the token. If the token lands on the symbol of a guardian, all players with settlements in that guardian's region get to take an essence card matching that region's terrain. If at a heartland, you'll choose which essence to take, unless you have a beacon there, in which case you get to take both. However, if a guardian is on a menace token, that area is threatened, and players can't receive essences this way from threatened regions. If the guardian is on a corruption token, then players who own regions there must perform a corruption event, as explained earlier. If the harvest token instead lands on a terrain icon, each player chooses one of their regions of that type, if they have one, and gets a matching essence card. Again, threatened regions do not provide essences here, and corrupted regions force those players to carry out a corruption event. The last phase to discuss is the hero phase. Now is when you can activate your heroes on the board, choosing from a number of actions that can be carried out in any order. Each active hero comes into play with two hero gems on their tile. If a hero gains enough perks to reach their fourth level, they'll receive an additional gem. These gems are what heroes use to take actions, removing one each time an action is taken. Basic hero actions are as follows. You can move a hero from one node to another node, following the area borders. They can move up to a number of times equal to their current level. Heroes can go through other heroes, but cannot stop on the same node. A hero adjacent to a region with a menace token matching their mask color can solve that menace by discarding the token, drawing a matching essence, and moving the relevant tracking token forward one space on their board. A hero can go on a quest. To do so, draw an essence matching that hero's color and place it in the quest area on your player board, secretly looking at its guardian side. Or a hero can go on a corruption quest by taking a corruption essence, available to heroes of any color. 
place this essence next to the relevant hero's tiles, again acknowledging its guardian side. A hero can only have one corruption essence quest, and your quest pool can only contain a number of quests equal to or less than your total number of perks amongst all active heroes. Solving a prepared quest is a separate action. To solve one, a hero of the matching color must be on a node of the region currently holding that card's great guardian. The card is revealed and added to your essence pool. If it was a corruption card, you trigger a corruption event instead. Those are all the basic hero actions you can perform, but perk tiles will give you more options. They may allow you to take additional actions with additional gems, enhance existing actions, or let you spend gems and essences for other rewards. There are also lore actions, which can only be taken if you have certain heirloom herb or attunement cards. The herbs allow a hero to solve the indicated menace type, and attunements let you move a hero from one node to another within that guardian's area. After using a lore action with one of these cards, rotate it to indicate its use. These can only be activated once per round. Again, the major goal of each player is to accomplish achievements as listed at the top of the board. Achievements are awarded for leveling up heroes, solving menaces, solving quests, among other things. Many achievements also have a minimum requirement. For example, you must have solved at least four quests to qualify for the most quests achievement. All players begin with the purity achievement, meaning they are at the lowest space of the corruption track. As soon as you meet the requirements for an achievement, place one of your tokens of your choice on that space. Then you have to spend one essence matching the color underneath the token you removed. If you can't or don't want to, the Doom token advances one space. Even if you can't or don't want to pay, you still get the achievement. The achievement token in this spot is not associated with an essence color, doesn't require payment, and doesn't advance the Doom token. If at any time a player no longer meets the requirements for an achievement, their token is removed and placed back on their board. There are a variety of different achievements that relate to almost every action you can take in the game, so be aware of them. After all players have carried out all three phases, the round ends. Flip the phase tokens back up, restore any spent cards and gems, pass the first player token to the left, and continue with a new round. The game can end in a number of ways. If one player reaches five or more achievements, the game is over at the end of that round, and whoever has the most achievements at that point wins. If all players have an equal number of achievements and they all share the purity achievement, they all win together. But if the Doom token ever reaches the last spot on its track, corruption takes hold and all players lose. And then there's the Corruption Sower. If a player's corruption token ever reaches the final space on that track, they replace one of their active hero's masks with the Corruption Sower's mask, and may replace any perks that hero had with new Corruption Sower perks. The Corruption Sower can only solve corruption quests and cannot solve menaces except through the use of certain perks. From now on, this player's goal is to have the Doom track reach its final space, in which case they win alone and all other players lose. If another player maxes out their corruption while someone else already has the corruption sower, the Doom token advances five spaces instead. In conclusion, gather essences, enhance your tribe, spread your influence, and end corruption, or encourage it. That's Sons of Fariel in a nutshell. Did you get all that?